Um, good morning to everyone. Uh, we would like to request uh, for everyone to take their seats as we will begin our program in the next few minutes. Okay. All of our panelists and all of our speakers have been are already here, so we invite everyone to take their seats, and we would like to invite everyone outside to please come in, and we will begin the program in a few minutes. Okay, um, we're wrap, uh, We're just closing everything and we're ready to start. So good morning to everyone. Hey, my name is Neville J. Manawis. I'm an instructor at the History Department of the School of Social Science Ateneo de Manila. And I will be your moderator for today. I, am, I will be in charge of uh, the program and help you guide through our very, very um, fascinating discussion for today. Okay, so we begin this, uh, we would like all your phones to be silent, and we will start first with the introduction of our speakers, and then after that, uh, we will have some panel reactors, and after the panel reactors, we will have an open forum for everyone to ask their questions. Okay, so it's all nice to see everyone here, and we're glad to be back, and this is a very large number of people okay, uh, from different uh, fields, Okay, we have students, we have teachers, academicians, and like. So we'd like to acknowledge everyone and thank you for taking the time to be here. And let us begin. Okay. The Ateneo Ricardo Leong Center for Chinese Studies is proud to present the Kumintang Southeast Asian Stronghold, Anti-Communism Identity, and the Chinese in the Philippines. This is in partnership with the History Department, Kaisa Para Sa Kaunlaran, and the Philippine Association of Chinese Studies. Okay. For today, okay, the Kuomintang Southeast Asian Stronghold, Anti-Communism Identity and the Chinese in the Philippines. We would like to start this with the welcome remarks from the Ateneo de Manila University. Dr. Sarina Saloma Akpindonu is a professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and the Dean of the School of Social Science of the Ateneo de Manila University. She obtained her doctoral degree in sociology from the uni Universitat Bill Lef Leffeld in Germany. Her MA in Population Science from Peking University in the Republic of China and her BA in Sociology from the University of the Philippines in Diliman. Her professional responsibilities include being Chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, Director of the Institute of Philippine Culture, President of the Philippine Sociological Society, President of the Women's Studies Association of the Philippines, Vice President of the Research Committee on the Sociology of Science and Technology of the International Sociological Association, and Chair of the Technical Panel for the Social Science and Communication of the Philippine Commission on Higher Education. As an experienced scholar working across the academic and applied context, her research on knowledge mobilization in social development the built environment and responsible consumption and production aims at promoting a problem-solving mode in social science engagement and the intelligent popularization of social issues. Let's give a warm round of applause to the Dean of Social Science to give our opening remarks. Thank you, Neville. Dr. Marjorie Manabat, Director of the Ateneo Ricardo Leong Center for Chinese Studies. Our guest speaker, Dr. Chen Wen Kung of the National University of Singapore. Our discussants, 
Mr. Sita Ang C of Kaisa para sa Kaunlaran Incorporated and Mr. Solomon Yui Tung of the Chinese Commercial News. Our partners for today's lecture, the Ateneo Department of History and its chair, Dr. Patricia Dakudao, and the Philippine Association for Chinese Studies and its president, Father Aristotle D. Faculty, staff, students, ladies, and gentlemen. Good morning. This morning's lecture contributes to a very important element of how we practice the social sciences in the, uh, in the School of Social Sciences of Ateneo de Manila University. So my thanks to the Ricardo Leong Center for Chinese Studies and the Department of History of the School of Social Sciences for bringing us all together this morning. So how do we practice the social sciences in Ateneo? Our practice of the social sciences is marked by translocal and transnational engagements. Translocality means being identified with more than one location or locality. In the same manner, transnationalism means going beyond the boundaries of the nation. For us in the School of Social Sciences, translocality means going outside of Ateneo, going outside of Metro Manila. Hence our engagements, for example, with what we call Global Mindanao. For us, transnationalism means creating geographical expertise among our faculty in a country other than our own. And we thank the Ricardo Leong Institute for Global and Area Studies for helping us support this goal of creating geographical expertise in the School of Social Sciences. The understanding of other localities, the understanding of other countries, is a way for us to understand the Philippines better. So we look forward to the reckoning with historical precedents of translocal and transnational phenomena. This morning, we're going to look at Kuomintang, nationalism, communism, anti-communism, and so on and so forth, as well as their contemporary and timeless manifestations in today's lecture. Such an understanding will surely allow ourselves to understand our country better, an understanding that is doubly significant as we learn more about the Filipino Chinese, especially against the backdrop of our country's political history of anti-communism. Once again, I welcome especially our guests and partners to our campus. While short, we hope that with your visit, you will get a flavor of the social sciences at the Ateneo de Manila University. Traffic will be particularly be bad between 12 noon and 1 p.m. Uh, today because of the grade school and high school dismissals. So I would suggest that you take the time to go around the campus and <laughs> visit the Arete or the Ateneo Art Gallery. Thank you and let's all have an insightful time this morning. very much Dean thank you very much for that warm and very welcoming remarks to all of us now let's go on to our speaker for the day our speaker from the National University of Singapore Dr. Chen Wen Kung is an assistant professor of history at the National University of Singapore he received his PhD in history from Columbia University and studies Chinese migration and diaspora and China's Southeast Asian relations in the 20th century his current book project is a history of Singapore, China, Taiwan, cultural relations in the 1970s and the 1980s. Let's give him a round of applause and to start our discussion.
Thank you. Thank you so much. I am absolutely delighted uh, to be here today, and I would like to express my gratitude uh, again to the Long Center, Kaiser, PAX, the Ateneo History Department, and the University at Large for organizing this, this event. Right. Uh, this is not my first time to Ateneo di Milano University. Uh, approximately nine years ago, uh, I was here as a PhD student affiliated with the Institute of Philippine Culture doing research on my uh, dissertation. I was living just across the street, across Katipunan Avenue, uh, and I, in fact, I, I presented an earlier version, uh, a chapter from the book, or the, one of the first versions of, the, of a chapter in the book uh, at, at IPC um, in what seems quite, quite a long time ago. Uh, I did research at the American Historical Collection, and I have fond memories of taking the LRT from uh, Quezon City to, to Intramuros, to, to Kaisa, to, to do research. Let me begin with three quotations, right, which I think capture some of the central questions in my, in my book. So the, the first two quotations are from officials affiliated with uh, an agency known as the Overseas Chinese Affairs Commission, right, Chiao Wu Wei, of the, the Republic of China. Right? In, in June 1952, the chairman of the, uh, of the Overseas Chinese Commission of the Republic of China, right, as cited in a U.S. Embassy uh, in Taipei report to the U.S. State Department, uh, expressed the view that the attitude of the Chinese in the Philippines was the best of all Southeast Asian countries. This was in 1952. Eight years later, the deputy chairman, Li Pusheng, of the, the same agency, wrote in his book, Overseas Chinese Friends I Admire, that in this current stage of anti-communist work, our comrades in the Philippines have shown the most energy and have been the most active, exclamation mark. Right. Uh, the third quotation comes from a uh, well-respected uh, educator, Chinese educator in the Philippines, uh, Dr. Bao Shitian, right, who was principal of, of Chiang Kai-shek High School and, and college. And in, 19, in the 1961 Fukien Times yearbook, he declared emphatically that there is absolutely no possibility of red infiltration into these schools, into these Chinese schools, for they have always been the vanguards of the anti-communist movement. These and other quotations that I encountered early on in my, in my research and field work uh, got me thinking about what some of the central issues and questions in the dissertation and book uh, would be. And these questions are as follows. Right? I have two for you today, two interlinked questions. Uh, the first, as, as suggested as strongly by these quotations, right, is how the Philippine Chinese became the most ardent diasporic supporters, diasporic Chinese supporters of the Republic of China, ROC, and its ruling Chinese Nationalist Party, the KMT, Kuomintang, right, after 1945, after the Second World War. So my book shows that for all the fears of quote unquote Chinese communism at the time in, in Southeast Asia and beyond, the quote unquote China that intervened the most extensively in any Southeast Asian country right, during the Cold War was not the People's Republic of China, but rather the Republic of China on Taiwan. So the question is how the Philippines became a stronghold for the Kuomintang ROC party state, right? which from 1949 onwards was uh, based in Taiwan. And I'll be answering these, these questions today in three parts. Uh, first, I'll talk about how the Chinese left, right? persons affiliated, sympathetic to the communist cause, ceased to be an effective alternative to the Kuomintang by the end of the 1940s. Next, I will focus on how legal and political arrangements between Manila and Taipei, or Nanjing, right, uh, helped produce 
the Chinese in this country as foreign subjects, foreign subjects that a foreign state could manage. Right? In this section, I will also talk about uh, anti-communist counterintelligence security co collaboration between the Philippine military uh, and the ROC right, that created a climate of fear in this country and helped silence ideological alternatives to Kuomintang ideology. In the third section of my lecture, I will talk about the ideology, motivations, and agency of Chinese themselves in the face of both Manila and Taipei's intervention in the community. Right. Uh, my book more or less ends in the 1970s. I will talk briefly about how Kuomintang hegemony ended uh, before, before, in my conclusion, uh, raising a few broader questions uh, about what this book means for the study of the Cold War, of the Cold War Philippines, and Chinese identity uh, in this country. So let me start by talking about a crucial period in the history of the uh, post-war Chinese community. And that is the period from 1945 to 49, a period that coincides with the Chinese Civil War in, in, in China, uh, but also, of course, the outbreak of the Hukbalahap Rebellion uh, in this country. So, uh, during this period, contingent developments were crucial right, in drastically reducing the strength of the Chinese left right, as a potential counterweight to the Kuomintang. Right? This period, in other words, is, is absolutely crucial if we are to understand the KMT's subsequent ascent and hegemony uh, by the 1950s. Uh, a little bit of history here uh, about the uh, about the Kuomintang and its and its main ideological rival, right? The Kuomintang had a presence in the Philippines going back to the early 20th century, or at least that's what the Kuomintang would like us to believe, right? Uh, in the 1930s, Kuomintang agents from China arrived in the Philippines, right? Uh, arrived in the Philippines to mobilize. Uh, the Chinese in this country in support of the newly established party state uh, in Nanjing. Right? Uh, conversely, the, the communist presence or the, the in, in this country is slightly more recent. Right? We can trace it back to the 1920s. Right? And it was uh, crucially the, the communist activists uh, from China who arrived in this country sought to establish close ties between Chinese and Filipino communists. They sought to establish close ties with the uh, PKP, the Philippine Communist Party. Right? Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, there were clashes between the Kuomintang and the Chinese left before the Second World War. Right? Uh, but during the war itself, during the Japanese occupation itself, both sides temporarily set aside their differences and formed multiple anti-Japanese guerrilla organizations. Perhaps the most well-known of these organizations is the Wachi, Right, which was affiliated with the, uh, with the left. Uh, but one organization that I would like you to keep in mind was a KMT organization called the Chinese Volunteers in the Philippines, or the CVP. Right. In the, following the occupation, right, uh, this is uh, what happens as far as the, uh, as far as the written, uh, written record tells us. Right. The Chinese left right, was resurgent and it uh, was implacably hostile towards persons whom it considered to be collaborators with the Japanese. These included not only Filipinos, such as Manuel Rojas, who of course would soon go on to become president, uh, but also members of the Chinese community, such as the prominent businessman Yu Ketai. Right. During this period, the Chinese left again sought to uh, maintain its close ties to the Philippine Communist Party, to the Hukbalahap, right? What happens, of course, then, is that Manuel Rojas, whom the Chinese left, you know, and the left more generally, has targeted, becomes president, right? Uh, the Rojas proceeds to enter into a arrangement with the Kuomintang, right? The Kuomintang puts aside whatever internal differences it might have, it collaborates uh, with the 
Philippine military, with the Philippine police, right, to crack down on the Chinese left. Right? And the persons involved in this, again, are persons affiliated with the Chinese volunteers uh, in the Philippines in particular. Right? So the period from about uh, 19, uh, from sort of late 1946 onwards is referred to by members of the Chinese left as a period of, uh, as a white terror. Right? Uh, the Kuomintang conversely describes this period as a period of bloody struggle right, between it and the, uh, and the Chinese left. Right? And so by the end of the 1940s, Right, this crackdown by the Philippine uh, security forces in collaboration with the Kuomintang right, results in key left-wing Chinese leaders right, fleeing the country. Right, key left-wing Chinese leaders, just as Ko King Sing, Xu Jingcheng, right, who returned to China by the, by the late 1940s. Right. Uh, by the end of the 1940s, key uh, organs of the Chinese left in this country have been uh, have shut down, right? Uh, and the whatever the, what little remains of the Chinese left-wing movement in this country goes underground. So by the end of the 1940s, for example, that publication on the left, the Chinese Guide, uh, has ceased uh, has ceased publication. Right? Uh, I, these, the publication on the right uh, is a Guomindang publication, as you can see, and it's a uh, it's an organization called the Mutual Aid Society. Again, something that I will be talking about uh, shortly. Right. This, of course, uh, you know, brings to an end what might be considered sort of a mini Chinese civil war in the Philippines. And the reason that many Chinese left-wing leaders choose to return to China at this time is, of course, because, well, for them, for them at least, things are going quite well uh, in China. Okay, let me now turn to legal and political arrangements between the Philippines and the, uh, and the Republic of China. Right? Uh, starting with questions of citizenship and naturalization. Right? Uh, one really important piece of legislation here is the 1929 Republic of China Nationality Law. This piece of legislation, Right, which was not, in fact, changed until the year 2000 when the Democratic Progressive Party came to power in Taiwan. Right? This piece of legislation was grounded in the principle of jus sanguinis, or blood right, citizenship. And what it effectively meant, right, from the Republic of China's point of view, was that any person of Chinese ancestry, regardless of where they had been born, was a quote-unquote Chinese national. Of course, the force of this particular piece of legislation depended on other countries' willingness to recognize it. And it just so happens that the Philippine government uh, came, to, came to support such an understanding of citizenship. Right? By the start of the Commonwealth period in this country in 1935, uh, political opinion in the Philippines had shifted in favor of your sanguine citizenship. Right. There's, a, there's a fantastic article by uh, Jun Aguilar right, uh, explaining this, this shift. Right. Uh, in 1939, the Philippines passed a new naturalization law, right, uh, which reflected this shift in the direction of pop, uh, populism. And this made the naturalization process for most Chinese, quote, prohibitively complex, costly, unsure, and slow. Right. Uh, this comes from a from from the word uh, from the mouth of Father Charles McCarthy, S.J. Right in 1974, Charles McCarthy uh, was a was a Jesuit priest. Right, was heavily involved in the movement for your solely citizenship uh, in this country. Right, and and so this is the most significant contribution by American Empire, right, to my to my narrative. In April 1947, the Republic of China and the Philippines signed a Treaty of Amity, right, which did not explicitly define citizenship, but which signaled, nonetheless, Manila's acceptance of you sanguinis, the idea that persons, uh, it was where you were, uh, your, your blood that determined which country you happened to be a national of. This piece of legislation 
authorized Nanjing, the Nanjing government, right, to establish and run its own schools in the Philippines. And since many such schools were run by the KMT, right, this piece of legislation effectively sanctioned the party's control of Chinese education, in addition to legitimizing the Kuomintang itself as a local or translocal Chinese organization. Right. Uh, the movement towards youth sanguinous citizenship in this country was consolidated in a landmark Supreme Court uh, ruling in, in shortly after the, the signing of the treaty, right? Uh, this was the case, this was the, uh, the case of Jose Tan Chong versus the Secretary of Labor. Uh, the Supreme Court in September 1947 stripped citizenship from Jose Tan Chong, right? And again, signaled the Philippines ex uh, embrace of youth sanguinous citizenship. So what does this all mean? Right. What it meant was that Manila, right, the Philippine government, was content for the Chinese in this country, and I should say that here again that historically the, this is one of the smallest Chinese communities percentage-wise right, in Southeast Asia, uh, to remain quote-unquote aliens. Right? That term gets used a lot to describe persons of Chinese ancestry in this country. Right. Manila was content for the Chinese in this country to remain aliens and foreigners. Right. Uh, it was not particularly interested in naturalizing them, in enabling them to become Filipino citizens. And that meant that Manila was quite fine with allowing an external state, right? an external state and local supporters of this external state to manage these so-called foreigners, these so-called aliens. Right? In this, again, in the context of the Cold War, it's especially important to remember that this is a period of the Cold War and that both uh, the Philippines and the Republic of China right, had much in common ideologically. Right? So this is, this is, again, an important reason why the Kuomintang was able to flourish unimpeded in this country and dominate associational and cultural life unlike other parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, that's an uh, image of uh, FDR signing the, the 1935 uh, Commonwealth Constitution. Let me turn now to the mid-1950s. Right? So this was a period during which uh, successive Philippine governments sought to intervene more extensively in Chinese economic and cultural life in this country. Right? Uh, in 1954, under Ramon Magsese, right, uh, the Philippines passed what, what became known as the Retail Trade Nationalization Act, right, which laid the foundations for uh, President Carlos Garcia's Filipino first uh, policy in the, in the late uh, 1950s. Right. During this period, the Department of Education also sought to nationalize Chinese schools, to exert greater control over Chinese schools, which were private institutions, right? private institutions which ran a dual language curriculum, both Chinese in both Chinese and English. Right. Uh, the Department of Education described these Chinese schools as, quote, sep a separate and complete system of education aimed at the training of the students for good Chinese citizenship. That said, right, there were limits, and this is important, right, there were limits to how far the Philippine state could and was willing to intervene in Chinese affairs, in local Chinese affairs. Right. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the Republic of China and the Kuomintang remained in control of these schools. The attempts at nat nationalizing these schools uh, were not especially successful. These schools remained largely untouched, right? But this ended up triggering a defensive cultural backlash on the part of Chinese conservative, conservative Chinese elites in this country. Right. Let's not forget that despite these, uh, these, these uh, nationalization measures, there were no concomitant efforts to simplify 
the naturalization process, the process by which foreigners could obtain Filipino citizenship. Right? The effect of this was, to, was a redoubling of Chinese conservative elites' commitment to anti-communism, right, uh, to ethnocentrism. Right? And the contrast here, I think, is striking when we turn to other Southeast Asian countries during this period. Right? In Malaya, for example, right, the British banned the Kuomintang in 1949. Uh, it's not that the British were, you know, were sympathetic towards communism, but they were quite wary of the Kuomintang's designs on the, obviously, the much larger, more politically uh, active and, and problematic Chinese community. Right? The Kuomintang was banned in Malaya in 1949 so that the Kuomintang would not impede what the British called Malayanization. Right? which was about uh, getting Malayan Chinese to identify fundamentally with Malaya rather than with, uh, rather than with China. Right? And, and such processes of uh, nationalization and naturalization take place elsewhere as well, but not in the Philippines, not until, uh, not until the 1970s. Let me now talk about anti-communist counterintelligence security cooperation between the Kuomintang and the Philippine military. Right. Such collaboration created a climate of fear. Right. It incentivized Chinese into informing on other Chinese. Right. The best example of this is the Yu Tong affair from 1962 to, to 1970, although arguably it lasts beyond 1970 as well. Right. The, the, there were, in, in, in 1952, right, uh, there were a series of mass arrests. Uh, approximately 300 Chinese across the country, not just in Manila, across the country were arrested in what amounted to the, the largest uh, counterintelligence cooperation, uh, counterintelligence operation uh, by the Philippine military uh, at the time. But as far as the, the documents that I've unearthed suggest uh, in Taiwan, uh, as far as they suggest, right, this particular case of the arrested Chinese did not involve co collaboration between the local KMT and the armed forces. Right? In fact, According to uh, the, the Taiwanese diplomatic records, right, the Kuomintang members themselves ended up, uh, ended up uh, being arrested. Right. Uh, as far as we can tell, these arrests were the result of collaboration between the military, right, uh, between uh, the military intelligence service and freelance informers. Right. Freelance informers from within the community who were not affiliated with the uh, with the Kuomintang. Right. The Republic of China Embassy and Chinese elites in this country, including many Kuomintang members, protested strenuously against this injustice. Right. As you can see from the from the timeline, uh, this case only really came to an end in 1961 when the last few remaining arrested Chinese were finally cleared of any wrongdoing. Multiple administrations basically passed the buck uh, to, uh, you know, down the line. Right. Crucially, I argue that the, that the spectacular uh, failure, right, at least from the Kuomintang's point of view, the spectacular failure on the part of the Philippine military is what uh, brings about a rectification of the anti-communist relationship. The Kuomintang is determined from this point onwards to ensure that all future anti-communist security operations in country against Chinese, right, go through the party, go through the, the embassy. And this is how we get to the Yu Yutong affair uh, from 1962 to 1970, right? No case study uh, better captures, I think, the the anti-communist security relationship between the Republic of China and uh, the Philippine military, right? Uh, Quintin and Rizal Yuitong, and I'm, very, I'm delighted that 
uh, Mr. Solomon Yu Tong is, is, uh, is, is with us today, right? Quentin and Rizal Yu Tong were the editor, uh, publisher and editor, respectively, of the Chinese Commercial News, right, which was one of four Chinese broadsheets at the time and uh, the most uh, well-read Chinese newspaper in the Philippines uh, at the time. Right? Uh, they were, in May 1970, deported to Taiwan, right, despite having been born uh, in the Philippines. Right? They were deported to Taiwan as, quote unquote, Chinese nationals on charges of being pro-communist. Right? Uh, tensions between, and to understand how this comes about, we need to go all the way back. We need to understand that the Chinese commercial news and the local Guangdang had long been at odds with each other, going, in fact, all the way back to the pre-war uh, period. Right? What, were th what were these tensions all about? Uh, the Chinese commercial news right, was one of the few uh, organs of the, uh, in this country, one of the few institutions in, in, this, in this country at the time that uh, supported Chinese cultural integration into the uh, Filipino national community. Right? This meant that it was at odds with the ethnocentric ideology of the Kuomintang, right? a party that insisted on uh, regarding persons of Chinese descent in this country as fundamentally Chinese. This was one source of tension between the, uh, between the Chinese commercial news and the Kuomintang, although what's interesting is that if you look at diplomatic records, the extensive diplomatic records from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of China, you will find no mention of integration, of cultural integration as an issue. Right. Uh, instead, these records are singularly focused on how the Chinese commercial news was a, quote, unquote, pro-communist organ. And the rationale, or the Kuomintang and, and the Republic of China's rationale for this was as follows. The Chinese commercial news published, provided balanced coverage of China. It published both uh, articles both in support of and in opposition and, and critiquing the Republic of China and the, and the People's Republic of China, right? Uh, it was a, by all, for all intents and purposes, a centrist publication that did not wish to take sides in the ongoing Chinese Civil War. From Kuomintang extremist point of view, this was evidence of sympathies for uh, communism, right? We need to sort of try to get in the heads of these, these Kuomintang uh, ideologues here. Right. Uh, the Yu Tong brothers were arrested for the first time in 1962, in March 1962. A, a number of other employees of the newspaper were arrested uh, as well. Right. Uh, that said, they were not deported. And this, again, this is a result of collaboration between local KMT activists the Republic of China Embassy, including the ambassador himself, right, and the military intelligence service. Right. Uh, so they are arrested for the first time in 1962. Uh, they are put on probation. Uh, and it, it's only some years later that they are arrested again and deported. What's changed? What changes from 1962 to 1970? Uh, 1970? The answer is Ferdinand Marcos Sr. In 1970, Ferdinand Marcos makes the decision to deport the Yuitongs, right? Uh, why, does he do, why does he do so? According to the, from the perspective of Filipino journalists who've covered, uh, who covered the arrests extensively, right? This was to test the waters in preparation for, for martial law, right? The idea of Marcos's rationale, according to these journalists, was uh, let me see if how people will react if I deport two Chinese journalists, right? Uh, this was Marcos paving the way for a more, his more extensive assault on the quote unquote liberal media, right? Okay, uh, let me shift our focus from, from state, from what states got up to, to the Chinese uh, community 
uh, itself, right? This is, a, this is a famous photo of Quintin and Rizal Yutong, right? With uh, the immigration commissioner at the time, Edmundo Reyes, who was a, uh, a crony of, of Marcos. But let me now turn to the Chinese community, right? To their motivations, to their agency, right? To their, to their ideology, right? Uh, I wanna, sh I wanna sort of share with you two, two documents, two really fascinating documents that I've, that I found, right? Uh, this, uh, this was what historians like to call a smoking gun. Document. It's not often that we come across such documents, but I was very fortunate to have come across this document, and you can imagine my my excitement at, at coming uh, at, at finding it. What is this document? This is a document. Uh, it's classified secret, right? It's found in a number of places. Uh, I first found it in Academia Historica in, in Taipei, right? Uh, and I came across it again in the papers of a gentleman named Ma Su Lei, right, at the Hoover Institution Archives at Stanford University. Uh, Ma Su Lei, or Ma Shu Li, is the author of this report, this secret report, uh, called The Execution of the Chinese Commercial News Case, a bit developing demonstrations and revolts, and guidelines for future work in the Philippines. Right, April 29th, 1970. This is just a few days, right, before Quintin and Rizal Yutong were deported to Taiwan, right? And this report details collaboration between Taipei, right, the local KMT, and the Philippine military in opposition to the Chinese commercial news going all the way back to 1969. They even came up with a fancy uh, uh, code name uh, for, the, for their operation. Uh, it was called Operation Thunderbolt. So I call this the Thunderbolt Plan uh, document. Ma Su Lei there is, is uh, th there's a picture of him, right, down there on the, uh, at the bottom right. Uh, Ma Su Lei ended up becoming Secretary General of the Kuomintang in Taipei in the mid-1980s, shortly before martial law came to an end in the, in the country. Right. The second document, uh, second source that I want to show you, or the second, is an excerpt from a 1953, the 1953 Philippine Chinese Business Guide and Pictorial Directory, right, published in Cebu. Uh, and, and this was, again, one of the many sources that I found at, uh, at the Chinbensi Library at, at Kaisa. And this is simply a list of the persons who, uh, of, of, the leadership, of the persons who were among the leadership of the Philippine Kuomintang in the early 1950s. I've translated some of the, the, the names uh, for you. As you can see, this, the, the ROC ambassador was, uh, was an advisor uh, to the Chinese Nationalist Party uh, headquarters. And you may recognize some of the other names uh, on this list. I triangulated or I, I examined this document in relation to, to other sources. And what I found was that many, as you can see from, my, from, the, from the highlightings, Many of the leadership, many leaders of the Kuomintang during this period were members of the Chinese volunteers in the Philippines. I mentioned the, the organization earlier, right? Which is the Kuomintang uh, anti-Japanese guerrilla organization in the Second World War. Many members of, uh, quite a number of uh, Kuomintang leaders during this period were also members of the Mutual Aid Society. The, which I will be talking about uh, now. Now, the, how do we understand the ideology and worldview of some of the Kuomintang's most fervent supporters? Right. The Kuomintang in the Philippines right, came to be dominated by an extreme right-wing quasi-fascist faction of the party, right? If you know something about Chinese history, you know that the Kuomintang was a very highly factionalized organization, right? There were members of the Kuomintang who were uh, actually quite sympathetic or more willing to work with the, with the communists. And there was an extreme right-wing faction, right, associated with an organization in China called the Blue Shirts, you know, Renaissance Society, to give it its, its formal name, 
right? The party in the Philippines came to be dominated by persons associated with these blue shirts, with these so-called Confucian fascists, right? Intelligence operatives, uh, in particular, Kwa chun Ki and Shi Yisheng, right, came to the Philippines in the 1930s to mobilize the local community in su a support of the KMT cause. They later established the Chinese volunteers in the Philippines during the occupation. Ma Shule, Ma Sule, right, was part of this uh, part of this right wing faction, although he did not remain for very long in the Philippines. Right. The Chinese volunteers in the Philippines right, won an intra party factional struggle, right, a struggle within the KMT uh, itself. Right. These were intelligence operatives, not members of the local business community, and these persons, in my mind, were true believers. Right. They had been trained, they had received military uh, and, and counterintelligence training in, in China. Right. The Guomidang in the Philippines also comprised, of course, members of the local business community, many of whom, as you can see, right, were, were part of the CVP and, and also uh, part, of the, uh, part of the Mutual Aid Society. Right. Persons like Yao Xiongxiu, right, Si An, Chua Lam Ko, and Antonio Rojas Chua, right? There were also, and so what I'm trying to do here is to give us a sense of the, the different kinds of people whom we sometimes tend, tend to lump together as part of the Kuomintang in this country, right? Uh, other influential businessmen were not party members, right? But supported, as far, you know, but supported the party's ideological cause, right? Well, we're quite, we're full-throated supporters of uh, the Kuomintang's ideology of Fang Gong Kang -e, or anti-communism and, and resist Russia, right? Yu Ke Tai was one such person. He was not a Kuomintang member. He was a naturalized Philippine citizen, right? But he was very much a cheerleader uh, for Chiang Kai-shek, right? Uh, even Alfonso Sisip, right, lent his considerable reputation to supporting the, the, the cause of anti-communism. Alfonso Sisip was a personal friend of Chiang Kai-shek's, but did not especially like the local Kuomintang, right, which sought constantly to marginalize him and eventually was able to do so, right, in part because uh, CSIP uh, belonged to a slightly older generation. Right. Uh, Pang Shitian, right, the, the longtime principal of Chiang Kai-shek College uh, slash high school, right, belonged to a different Kuomintang faction. Uh, Pao Shitian was from Hubei, which is very unusual in, in, in the Philippine context. He did not speak Hokkien, right? But he was an equally staunch anti-communist, and he relied on culture and education to promote Kuomintang ideology, right? Uh, Kuomintang ideology in this country, anti-communist, Kuomintang anti-communist ideology in this country, as I've suggested to you, is inseparable from uh, ethnocentrism, from Chinese ethnocentrism. This was the Kuomintang in the Philippines. The, again, the ROC embassy oftentimes worked with the local Kuomintang, but again, we should not, I think we should think of them as being somewhat separate uh, entities. So ideology is clearly important, right? But so too, I argue, right, is expediency, right? It was not just about belief. Belief is, is for historians, is difficult to, to, to grasp, right? How do I know that a historical figure truly and genuinely believes in, in something, right? That's actually, it's difficult for us to, to answer such questions uh, with full certitude, right? What we do know in the context of the Cold War post-colonial Philippines, in the context of anti-Chinese, of the anti-Chinese climate, is that anti-communism could be profitable, right? Shi Yisheng, shown here, hobnobbing with uh, with uh, a member of the U.S. military, right? Shi Yisheng, who was one of those Kuomintang agents sent to, China, uh, sent to the Philippines in, in the 1930s to organize the community here, right? Who became Secretary General of the local Kuomintang, right? Shi Yisheng exploited his intelligence connections with both the Philippine Military Intelligence Service and the United States to blackmail local Chinese, right? He would go up to local Chinese and uh, wealthy local Chinese and tell them, you know, I've heard that uh, the military thinks that you are a communist, 
right? Well, I can deal with that. You just need to give me some, you just need to pay me, right? Uh, this eventually gets him into trouble uh, with, with, the, uh, with the authorities, right? But, he, you know, but by the late 1950s, it seems to me that he's, re he's been rehabilitated, right? What I argue in my book is that anti-communism enabled persons, different, different Chinese persons, to perform right, the right, the correct, but also the right ideological identities in the context of the Cold War and anti-Chinese discrimination. Right? That by signaling one's support for, a, for an ideological cause that both states were committed to, right, anti-communist practices uh, helped mitigate racial and discrim legal discrimination. It was a survival strategy, a strategy of adaptation. And thus, anti-communism became, for many Chinese, a component of their identity, or at least the identity as it was publicly displayed. Right? Uh, I don't think we can just understand Chinese identity in this period in terms, solely in terms of ethnicity and culture narrowly defined. We, crucially, the, the mid-19, I, I keep on coming back to the mid-1950s here because this is a period during which uh, the conservative elites, Chinese conservative elites in this country, right, mobilize in response to Filipinization by restructuring uh, some of the key, organiza key organizations, institutions of, of the Chinese community, right? Uh, this takes place, again, in, in, in the context of efforts to Filipinize Chinese, Chinese schools and uh, retail trade nationalization. Uh, in 1954, the Federation of Filipino Chinese Chambers of Commerce and Industry is, uh, is, is founded. Right? This, the Shangzong, right, was a much more overtly pro Kuomintang organization than the, general, the, the Manila General Chinese Chamber of Commerce that it replaced. The Manila Chinese Chamber of Commerce still exists today, but it exists in the shadow of the Federation, which is the acknowledged uh, leader, uh, the, the leading organization uh, of the, the community. Right. In 1956, an organization called the Philippine Chinese Anti-Communist League, right, whose coat of arms I've shown here, is, is formed. Right. The Philippine Chinese Anti-Communist League replaces a, a, you know, uh, the, the earlier uh, Chinese anti-communist movement. Right. These organizations are formed to help coordinate and propagate a certain ideology. Schools, right, schools play an especially critical role in sustaining Kuomintang hegemony. Right. My book focuses uh, specifically on Chiang Kai-shek High School. Right, or Chiang Kai-shek College, uh, as, it, as it became known. Right. During this period, uh, the textbooks that ethnic Chinese students in the Philippines read were from Taiwan. Many uh, teachers at these schools right, were trained in Taiwan. There were frequent visits by of Republic of China officials uh, to these uh, two institutions like, like Chiang Kai-shek High School. There was close coordination between these various institutions, between the, the Shangzong, between the PCACL, and, and schools. Right? Uh, the reasons for this are, are, are two. Right? One was that the leadership of these organizations was overlapped considerably. Right? There was a point in time in which Yu Ketai was both principal of Chiang Kai-shek High School and president of the Federation of Filipino Chinese Chambers of Commerce and Industry at the same time. Right. So the leadership of these organizations overlapped with each other, and many of these institutions, especially those in Manila, were in close physical proximity to each other. And so it was easy, for example, for the PCACL to stage anti-communist rallies at Chiang Kai-shek High School with support from, the, uh, from local business leaders, with support uh, from the, from the Shangzong. Let me show you a few images that, I've, that I find especially uh, instructional and striking. Uh, the image on the left is, uh, you know, we, we will 
is of Sun Yat-sen High School and the Kuomintang headquarters in Iloilo City, right? This is from, again, from the Philippine Chinese Business Guide and Victoria Directory of 1953, right? Uh, as you can see from the image, the party and the high school basically occupy the, the same building. The image on the right comes from a publication called the Pacific Review, which I have found in only one place, and that is the Ateneo de Manila University Library. Right? Uh, it's, a, it's an image of the inauguration and induction ceremony for officers of the Pampanga Province chapter of the PCACL on July 25th, 1957. Right? The PCL made a big deal of the fact that it had branches throughout the country, right? Uh, and, and in fact, uh, Manila, leaders of the PCL from Manila, accompanied by ROC diplomats, went on a tour of the entire Philippines, setting up these, these branches in the years after 1956. Right. A, my, my book also talks about the many, or attempts to talk about many of the some of the visits that Filipino Chinese during this period made to Taiwan. Right? On the left, we have uh, a photograph of a Philippine Chinese delegation visiting Kimoy, Jinmen, right, in September 1950. Uh, Kimoy, for those of you who don't know, Kimoy is an island chain just off the coast of Xiamen. Right? In fact, it's closer to the PRC than it is to, uh, to the island of Taiwan, but it, it's you know, it's under the jurisdiction of the, the Republic of, of China, right? It was the site of uh, multiple cross-strait crises between the PRC and the ROC, right? In September 1950, the Philippine Chinese became the first overseas Chinese community in, in, in the world to send a delegation to the newly established Republic of China government in Taiwan, and as part of their visit, they got to visit, uh, part of their visit to Taiwan, right, they were able to visit uh, uh, Kimoy, as you can see from this, from this image here. The image on the right, right is of, well, it shows a Philippine Chinese delegation in Taiwan for what might be called military service or Jun right, in, in 1954. The delegation leader, as you can see from the image, the, this was multiple overseas Chinese delegations, right, were present, right, went to Taiwan to engage in, in, in these kinds of activities, right. The Philippine delegation leader is reading out a declaration, right, on behalf of all the overseas Chinese delegations. You can see one from, from Thailand on the, on the right-hand side of the, of the picture. Right? And this person was interviewed in a very, very useful volume published uh, in Taiwan in 19. 96. Right. Uh, I often get asked about the economic ties right, between Chinese here and, and Taiwan. And I will say that you know, if you are looking for a, something to, to work on, a research topic to work on, this definitely deserves further research. And I wish that I could have talked more about it in my, in my book. Right. Although I do think that finding reliable sources on such ties uh, will be difficult. The answer may lie not in Taiwan, but in, but in Hong Kong. Right. Uh, however, I attempted to deal with the, the economic dimension in my, in my book. I think it's important to remember that many leading Chinese anti-communists in this country were not from the business community. They were educators, they were school principals, they were, they were journalists. Right. They were the ones, in fact, many of the most ardently, uh, those most ardent supporters of the Kuomintang, right, like Kwa Chun Ti, for example, were, were not businessmen, right? Uh, to the extent that the written record that I've, you know, that the written sources suggest, there was, as you can see, Philippine Chinese investment in, in Taiwan, right? But overt manifestations of support for the Republic of China antedated, right, this. I think it's better to think of economic flows as evidence of pre-existing support rather than wholly driving such support. Another thing to keep in mind is that Taiwan, uh, 
throughout the 1950s is not an especially attractive destination for foreign capital, right? And this was because, of course, during that period, uh, Taiwan was basically kept afloat by U.S. military and economic aid. It didn't need, right, uh, investment from, from elsewhere. Right? But again, I think this is something that uh, more people should write about. Okay, uh, let me talk briefly now about how Kuomintang hegemony uh, in, in the Philippines unravels, right? Famous photo of uh, the Marcoses meeting Mao in, in 1974, right? Mao, as you can see, is not well, right? <laughs> Kuomintang dominance over civic associational life in, in this country was considerable, maybe second only to, to Taiwan itself. But that dominance could only impede, slow down cultural integration, not stop it entirely. Right? Dissent, and unlike in other parts of Southeast Asia, dissent and resistance in this country was minimal. But it was not absent. Right? And in fact, I would argue that it took the form not of overt support for the PRC, Right, for this would have been most unwise in the context of the, the ideological climate at the time. Rather, dissent and resistance took the form of what I like to call anti-anti-communism or non-anti-communism. Right. Two good examples of this are, first, the Chinese commercial news' support for cultural integration and its balanced centrist coverage of news on China. Right, which, of course, Kuomintang extremists interpreted as being supportive of communism. Right. Uh, the second example for, of this, of course, it has to do with the rise of uh, Kaisa right, and, the, uh, and the campaign for Yus Soli citizenship in the 1970s. Again, this is not about coming out in support of the PRC, but it's about sort of striking at some of the ideological foundations of, of Kuomintang hegemony um, in this country. Right. Uh, the Yu Yutong affair, uh, uh, the deportation of the Yu Yutongs to, to Taipei, right, seemed at the time to represent the high watermark of anti-communist collaboration. But ironically, things change rapidly afterwards. It's an ironic turning point. Right? Under martial law, uh, under one form of authoritarianism, one form of authoritarianism ironically contributes to the beginning of the end of Kuomintang hegemony uh, in this country, right? Uh, within three years of declaring martial law, Mar Marcos has facilitated mass naturalization. He has normalized relations between uh, Manila and, and Beijing, right? Uh, Chinese, he has nationalized Chinese schools. And all this, again, is the beginning of the end of Kuomintang hegemony um, in this country. But this decline is slow, right? It takes a number of years for this, for this to happen, right? Arguably, it's not until uh, the 1990s, right, uh, that the power balance in, in the community has, has shifted. Again, this is something that I don't really talk about in the book but which I think it'd be really fascinating to, to follow up on. Okay, that, let me end with a few uh, concluding thoughts, right? How do we understand Kuomintang hegemony in the Cold War Philippines, right? Uh, I suggested to you that it's important to think about contingency, right? It's important to think about the period from 1945 to 49, a period during which the main ideological competitor uh, of the uh, Kuomintang, right, is deinstitutionalized. Right? It's important, I think, to think about structures and institutions, to think about the legal frameworks in place, right, that facilitated uh, Kuomintang hegemony, particularly with regards to citizenship and naturalization. Right? It's important to think about the structures and institutions of the community that facilitated the propagation of, of ideology. And it's also important, again, I think, to, to look at, to take seriously the agency and the motivations of anti-communists, or persons who identify themselves as anti-communists, right? From uh, the extreme right-wing faction of the Kuomintang uh, to ordinary Chinese, right, who participated in 
Kaminsky forming Dan's ideological project. Right? Above all, I think we need to take into account the three-way relationship between the Republic of China, the Philippines, and the Philippine Chinese, and how each, right, each faction, right, each side, right, sought to position itself against uh, the others. Right. I want to I want to end with two questions, two broad questions. Again, you know, questions uh, that I think the the book touches on, right, which, which go to the heart of the, the arguments that I'm trying to make in the book. And the first is what it means to think about the Cold War Philippines, sort of Cold War post-colonial Philippines in Asia. Right? So much scholarship on the Cold War Philippines focuses on the, and, and rightly so, right, focus on, focuses on the relationship between the Philippines and the United States. And, and this is, again, something that characterizes how most people understand the Cold War in this part of the world. Right? <laughs> But I think my book tries to show that we need to look beyond the U.S.-Philippine relationship and to the Philippines' ties with other Asian countries. Right. The, my final question, again, has to, goes to, goes to the, addresses the question of, of Chinese identity right, and what it meant to be Chinese in the Philippines during the Cold War. Uh, what I've tried to show you today is that ideology, anti-communist ideology, was central to how many Filipinos, uh, Chinese Filipinos, performed their identities in the context of this particular period in, in history. Right? That anti-communism was, was an important dimension of how these persons uh, sought to represent, represent, them tell, represent themselves in the context of anti-Chinese uh, discrimination and legislation. It was a means of survival. It was a means of adapting to the um, to the ideological climate of the times. That concludes my talk for today. And again, I thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the Q and A. Thank you very much. Uh, for that very insightful and fascinating talk, and I'm sure a lot of people have questions, but let's go first to our panel of reactors. Uh, Teresita Angsi has played a significant role as a bridge of understanding, acceptance, and cohesion between Filipino Tsinoy. Sorry? <laughs> okay, I'll cut it, ma'am. <laughs> okay, uh, colloquial term for Chinese Filipino. She is an academic researcher. Uh, professor, social activist, development worker, peace and justice advocate, writer, author, and public service awardee in many sectors. I hope that is good, ma'am. Uh, without further ado, Mr. Rosita Angsi. Somebody sent a long, long introduction of me into to Ateneo. I hope. Thank you for not reading it, and thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, uh, and to the audience for braving the traffic and coming here. Uh, thank you, of course, for uh, to Dr. Kong Chen Wen for gracing this occasion, accepting our invitation to come here to talk about this period in history that very few really know about. I'm sure most of you learned something new uh, because he contributed something to the knowledge of the history of the Chinese in the Philippines that uh, very few uh, know about. Of course, we in Kaisa uh, personally is very happy because uh, in his introduction, he talked about uh, being surprised to find the wealth of materials, research materials, <laughs> uh, complete research materials on his topic in the Tendency Memorial Library. In fact, yesterday there was a Mexican uh, researcher who also found his way to our library and said <laughs> he was really surprised because he can finish his PhD dissertation just by staying in our library. Anyway, plugging, uh, plugging aside. Um, I'd like to situate uh, Dr. Kong's talk to the present as an introduction. What comes to your mind when he talk about anti communism, about the uh, period of white terror. By the way, we have students here from Philippine Cultural College. How many of you have heard about what he talked about 
from your parents or grandparents, medyo young eh, but most of them are faculty members, but there are Chinois there. How many of you have heard what Dr. Kong talked about from your grandparents? Hindi pwede siguro parents, grandparents. Yeah, not, nobody. Uh, I made a very informal survey of I think about 30 people, only about six knew about what he was talking about. So that's why I said his book is a very, very welcome contribution after Dr. Wickberg, after Dr. Antonio Tan. So this is a new period of history that few people really knew about. So what comes to mind when he, uh, in his talk, what comes to my mind, of course, is uh, the expertise of Dr. Romel Banlawi here, the anti-terrorism law, of course, and uh, especially the ELCAC, you know what the LCAC is, of course, the uh, task force on ending the local communist armed conflict. Uh, of course, um, let me quote um, Kaloy Conde, red tagging, no? the, the ELCAC uh, or the anti-communist, the new word today is red tagging. It's a pernicious practice that targets people who often end up being harassed or even killed. Red tagging is rapidly shrinking the space for the peaceful activism in the Philippines. Red tagging was Duterte's official policy, and it looks like it will be Marcos' policy too, despite the more than 20 cases in the Supreme Court to declare the Anti-Terrorism Act unconstitutional. Recall the many activists community workers, journalists recently arrested for suspicion of NPA involvement. Our neighboring school, UP, the professor just two weeks ago, Melanie Flores, was accused of being a recruiter, an organizer, a member of the Communist Party, but he was, she was arrested by virtue of an arrest warrant that states her failure to remit SSS contributions of her kasambahay. Of course, her defense is that that kasambahay uh, left her already in 2013 and the case is 2019. So that blatant abuse of power is reminiscent of a chapter in uh, Dr. Kong's book. Um, I'm the last minute a filler as reactor <laughs> because the, the reactor uh, was not, it cannot come. So. I put down my notes mostly from my review of Dr. Kong's book. The, uh, the comments are additional inputs. Uh, many of these comments are not in the original review because it was a long, long one and by limitations of the number of words, I will just uh, add some of these inputs to, to his talk. But, um, okay. Um, Professor Kong, of course, un, uh, enhanced our understanding and enabled us to appreciate the trilogy of forces he, he talked about in his conclusion. The KMT as a government within our own government, the Philippine government, and the de facto leaders of the community, of the Chinese Filipino community, whether they're pro-left or they're pro-right. They influenced and deeply impacted the lives of the Chinese Filipinos in that period. It was, of course, before martial law, but the, the military reigned supreme even during those times. I recall a good friend uh, who recounted to me how his dad never recovered physically, mentally, and financially after his arrest during the Jin Chiao An event. No one dared to do business with him for fear of being red tag. I find no... Uh, explanation or English equivalent of the Jin Chiao An event. So let's just say Jin Chiao suppress the Chinese because it is not talked about precisely. You don't find it in any of the even Western sources precisely because uh, uh, it's rarely talked about. There were many stories of people who went underground or went to rural areas for fear of being falsely arrested on mere suspicion. We heard stories from uh, about the victims of Jin Chiao An at the Communist Witch An only in whispers from our elders or their children because they preferred to sweep the events under the rug. But events happened and would impact the community for several decades or at least for one generation. I, for example, I myself was 
quite surprised that the few pe elders that I who know about the Chin Chiao and who I invited to come or have a round table with uh, Dr. Kong refused. They said it's in the past, never mind, forget about it. So until now, they still don't like to talk about it. If there is something that demonstrates why military intelligence is an oxymoron, that is that period, the fiasco of the white terror going uh, afterwards to the Qin Chiao An. The description of how the bad elements in the Chinese community in the KMT headquarters and in the Philippine military connive to harass, to torture, to persecute detractors and pro leftist elements in the community. Supposed to be, of course, products of Philippine military intelligence. Facts on how in the guise of anti-communist campaign, evidence was planted, so nothing is new, but evidence was planted in offices or residences of businesses. Some of them are rivals in business who wanted to just uh, bring down the other one, so reported to the military that this guy is pro-communist. So despite uh, evidence to the contrary, it took uh, in, on average, more than four years to have some of the accused uh, in the Qin Chao An affair released. So the, it started 1952, ended 1961, because some of, some of them were arrested uh, in stages, okay? Some of them were arrested just because their name sounded the same, because they do not know, uh, Chine, they do not have Chinese characters. There's no Chinese expert in the Philippine military, which we've been agitating. If you want really good relations with China, please uh, try to train uh, Chinese experts who read Chinese, or at least can read the Chinese names, because many of them were arrested just because their names sounded the same. For example, Kong Chen, when some, somebody maybe is uh, Kong Hua, 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 Wen, or something like that. But they, they were arrested for lack, for lack of um, evidence. Um, in much the same way as the Yui Ting brothers were arrested because they couldn't read really what was written in those uh, uh, editorials and, and, uh, and uh, articles in the Chinese commercial news, okay? Um, the, 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 of course, that's why I said the Qin Chao An was uh, repeated in the Yu Yi Ting affairs because they couldn't understand um, the, the the articles. So if there's one thing also that demonstrated how the Philippine state allowed the KMT to work as a government within the government, it's again the Qin Chao and, and the Yu Yiting brothers affair. Uh, Solomon Yu Yiting here will talk about the, the Yu Yiting affair uh, late, later on, huh? so I'll not elaborate. So Kong's lecture and his book, of course, uh, added, uh, has become a very important resource material in the history and political dynamics of how an entire community which struggled to be a model minority so they can be left alone to do what they do well, business, retail trading, buy and sell, and how they fell victim to the KMT leaders who acted, uh, who, who, who acted in, as the surrogate of the go Philippine government in administering the affairs of the um, Chinese community in the Philippines. So uh, last part is that um, I agree with the author that the Philippines is, is the last bastion of KMT influence in Southeast Asia. No other country has allowed the KMT to rule all aspects of ethnic Chinese community life in the affairs of the Grand Family Association, the Federation of Filipino Chinese Chambers of Commerce, and especially in education through the General uh, Association of Chinese Schools. These influences lasted at least two decades after diplomatic relations. So I don't agree with the author. I, I agree with the author that the main is 1950 to 1970, but I would like to extend the KMT influence to at least 1995. Uh, there are many events uh, that would prove, prove it, and uh, how the Federation, the Grand Family Association leaders will go abroad or go to the provinces instead uh, whenever there are visiting dignitaries from China. 
and that was the period when the uh, Amity Club and the Kezi Lian He Hui was, was born. So the first official trip of the Federation to China was uh, actually in 1995, not under the banner of the Federation, but uh, as a banner of an ASEAN tour that included China. The KMT control of the Federation's elections on education, on uh, Grand Family Association, demonstrate also the widespread influence of the pro-Taiwan inclination of the Chinese community in the Philippines as the last stronghold of uh, KMT influence in South, Southeast Asia. Yet, the KMT control is not all pervasive, as people outside the community thought. Uh, Dr. Kong showed the picture of Iloilo, uh, where the KMT flag, the KMT headquarters, but there's another school, of course, that is more uh, very progressive no? and uh, known to be more pro-leftist. There are other organizations always also that manage to have full, full control of their own uh, leadership and organization. Above all, uh, in the 70s, the Chinese Filipinos, of course, uh, generation, the new generation of local born, well integrated Chinese Filipinos came of age. This is what the Yuyitung older, the elder Yuyitungs were pushing for the full integration of the Chinese uh, Filipinos in mainstream society. So they are independent of any control, committed to the country of their birth, the only country they have known. Uh, this was the period when the Pagkakaisa sa Pagunlad was put up in 1971 to fight for you solely citizenship, citizenship by, by birth, because their first language is either English or Filipino. They have known no other country except the Philippines. They have never set foot uh, on China or Taiwan. So the, it, the integration movement uh, uh, took, took, um, uh, was hastened after the 1975 diplomatic relations and after the 1975 mass naturalization of the Chinese Filipinos. So more than the Cold War, as the title of the book said, Diasporic Cold Warriors, or the dialectical struggle between the Kuomintang and the leftist forces in the Philippines, which the author described uh, in the central theme of his work, I would like to reflect more uh, on um, his theme on the role and the status of the Chinese Filipinos in mainstream Philippine society and the social political environment that shaped this status through several ages of its evolution. The, before 1975, because of the lack of citizenship, because they could not practice um, any professions, they could only be in business, the integration process was much, much slower. But as a result of the uh, desire to recognize the People's Republic of China, Marcos, of course, uh, gave easy access to naturalization, and this hastened considerably the integration process and uh, more or less um, established the identity of the Chinese Filipinos, Filipino in identity, but recognizing their Chinese roots and their racial heritage. The vulnerability of the community to political maneuvering by KMT and the military and the inability of the many existing Chinese organizations then to speak up and champion the causes of the oppressed is indeed a sad chapter in the ethnic Chinese uh, community history. But today, uh, we have a community run by leaders um, who are local born, who recognize that their ties are with the Philippines, their future and their fate lies with the Filipino, their bonds are uh, their roots are deep in Philippine soil and their bonds are with the Filipino people. So th this is what I would like to leave as the last word uh, for you to take home when you think of his last question. Uh, what, is the post what is the identity of the Chinese Filipinos after the Cold War? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, take on the book and also the presentation. And now let's call Mr. Solomon Y. Yu Yitong. He's a publisher for the Chinese Commercial News and their family is a victim of the Cold War. Uh, 
good morning, everybody. Uh, I, I, I'll just talk about uh, Chinese commercial news. It's, uh, I think I, I read the book, and I think there's only two actors in the book that is still around. One is Chinese commercial news, the other is Sektari and Relay. So <laughs> maybe you should advise uh, and Relay to, to, to be also a reactor, you know. But uh, basically, I learned a lot from uh, uh, Dr. Hong about my, 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 my father, you know, that the first thing that is surprised me is that he was able to, to find out that my father went on a cruise ship to Hong Kong and Japan. I thought, wow, it's a nice vacation now on a cruise ship, you know. But he, 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 he actually, he, he, he and, and I think he got, he got the record from the CIA, right? Uh, uh, and there was a, a American GI shadowing him in Japan because he's supposed to be not with the J Japanese communist leader or whatever, you know. But of course, he went there to buy a machine for our, our newspaper, you know, just to, 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 to uh, uh, there, there's, a, there's a machine that do the, before the, the printing of the machine, I mean printing, I'm, I'm very familiar. So to, before you print the newspaper, you have to pick up all the type, monotype. And this machine are, are probably at that time is made in Japan, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the reason why he went to Japan. And when he was in, 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 in Hong Kong, he was shot by the British, British agent, you know. And when he got back, he was integrated by the MIS, you know, so that is his first uh, brush with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, uh, with the military. But uh, aside from that, you know, a lot of things that you, 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 we're talking about the, our newspaper is uh, supporting the integration, especially my uncle, Rizal. And he not only support his children study at Ateneo, and Mary Nall. Uh, and it, I remember uh, the late uh, Ambassador Yuchengo told me that he never studied in a Chinese school. He studied La, 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 uh, La Salle, you know. And I was surprised, you know, be, you know your, your parents are both Chinese. Why should you study La Salle, you know? And he, they, they were the early you know, in the, they, they already practiced integration that early, you know, in, in, in the, probably in the, in the 20s, you know, that, that's a long time ago, you know, that uh, I studied that. In our case, I still study, in, you know, uh, most of my age are studying in Chinese school, you know, I study in Grace Christian High School. So right now, my father is considered Chinese, I'm considered Chinoy, my son is now Pinoy. You know, so I think that's the integration now, you know. So that, that's what's happening now, you know. And, and I'm glad that uh, Dr. Hong was able to research uh, on the Kuomintang in the Philippines, you know. But I, I just kept asking him, why, why a Singaporean would do that, you know. Maybe it's the correct person because you have the independent mind instead of somebody from here doing that research, you know. You'll be influenced already, you know. So that is the right person to do that, you know. And I don't know how many years you took took you probably ten years. Okay. No, yeah. Oh, yeah, more, probably more, you know. So pr probably, you know. And and uh, although right now is there's more online, unlike ten years ago, probably less, you know. So that's that's a lot of work, you know. I congratulate Dr. Hong to do this book, you know. And I think probably this is I don't know about uh, I, I'm not a historian, you know. Uh, but uh, I think this is one, uh, the, the only one, or very few, on, on a very uh, in in in, uh, in depth on on the on, on this uh, coming tongue relation in, you know, with the Chinese. Ch Ch but I, I think there's a reason for that. Uh, why why the coming tongue is very strong in the Philippines? You know, Philippines is also unique. You must remember that Philippines is the only Catholic or Christian country in Asia because of our Spanish uh, influence. And, and probably, probably because of the US, uh, uh, US uh, we are under the US uh, occupation for, for about 50 years. So Chi Taiwan and US are very good. Uh, they are together. So that's why they can influence uh, Philippines instead of influence Malaysia or Indonesia or Vietnam, you know, because of the U.S. relation in the Philippines, you know. 
So, and, and for, for Chinese commercial news, you know, as I said, you know, uh, you, you talk about Marcos and, and the Uito. I think when, when they were deported in 1970, there's a reason why Marcos is doing that. He's already looking forward to declaring martial law. And probably, you know, Philippines, is, we, we never have political prisoner. So they have to learn from Taiwan, which has, has been under martial law for the longest time, how to deal with political prisoner. Th there's no political camp. There's no bikutan, you know. And, and, and probably that is already in the back of mind of Marcos that he's preparing. And I remember my father was telling me that when he was uh, d detained in the, in the camp, he's, he saw visiting Philippine general, visiting the camp. And they were probably preparing for the martial law in 1972, September 21, 1972. They, they were probably learning how to put up the detention camp, how to do a lot of thing, you know. So. They, they are the, they, 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 they learn, or probably, they not only learn, but probably the, the Taiwan intelligence has people, you know, teach, training the people here how to make it into a, a declared martial law, you know. Uh, I, I think when, 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 uh, when, when uh, Marcos uh, declared martial law, all this, uh, Newspaper people were detained at the Bigutan because you cannot just put them anywhere. They are not criminal, you know. Uh, you, you, you're saying that uh, the 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 Philippine press was uh, they they were saying that Marcos that uh, the reason why they deported the Uito is that next will be the, the the Philippine press, and it's it's really happened. What happened in 1970 happened to them in 1972. All the paper were closed down. And I remember a political uh, editorial ca cartoon of Philippine Free Press. It sh after they were deported to Taiwan, it shows a guillotine of, of a person being about to be chopped, chopped, chopped his head down. And it says, the uh, Witong brothers, who's next? Being saying the Philippine press is next. And it's it's true true what happened afterward, you know, that what happened to 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 Yui Tung or to Chinese commercial happened to all of them, you know. So I cannot uh, this basically this is what I can say about uh, the, the the book, you know. But a lot of interesting I, I, uh, happened during that time, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, may we invite again Dr. Chen Wen Kung uh, in front uh, if you have any questions uh, that you may want to ask or raise. Uh, we will have a short uh, forum for everyone. Um, for those who are approaching the mic, please uh, let us know who you are and uh, address it to all of our panelists in front. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, 
Yeah, I'm Dr. Tan Cho Chong. Yeah, I'd just like to share something. Earlier, uh, Ma'am Teresita Ansi mentioned about Philippine Cultural College, okay? And then at that time, uh, I, have <laughs> I have some thoughts. Uh, I'd like to share some of my knowledge and experiences during my time. And uh, I think what that was uh, during the uh, Philippine Cultural College, uh, during uh, our time, that was uh, the name was a Philippine Chinese High School, okay? And uh, the, opposite, oh, the opposite side of the street is uh, Chiang Kai-shek High School at that time, okay? And during that time, Chiang Kai-shek uh, High School was a stronghold of Kuomintang. Hmm? And uh, they always say that uh, Philippine Chinese High School uh, was a communist school. So that was the experience at that time. So this is for the, for the information of these uh, students from Philippine uh, Cultural College. And that's one. And uh, I'd like to say something about uh, the Yu Yitung brothers, okay? The Rizal and the Kinten Yu, Yi, Yu Yitung. I don't think both, I don't think they are communists. They were just uh, dedicated uh, journalists reporting objective news about China. During that time, uh, in early in 60s and 70s, uh, many people, many Chinese uh, were against, uh, were quietly against uh, Kuomintang, okay? They were afraid to voice out, mm, but deep inside they were against the Kuomintang. And uh, Chinese Commercial News was the only newspaper that uh, published uh, news, objective news about, uh, about, about uh, mainland China, okay? And in fact, uh, during that time, the, uh, I remember Senator Katigbag, uh, together with a group of reporters, they went to China. And uh, Chinese Commercial News was the only newspaper that uh, published the the uh, reports about China, and that was a daily report, and that uh, the news report about China was published in Chinese commercial news for, I think, several weeks, okay? So that's something I'd like to share. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you know, you're 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 absolutely right about the about the Chinese commercial news's coverage. Uh, what's interesting is that um, that Filipinos were actually able to travel to China starting in in 1965, uh, when when Marcos, of course, came was elected, uh, and and the Filipino media, as in the non-Chinese media, was actually quite you know. Its coverage of news on China was actually far more far more lively uh, than that in the, the Chinese media, with the exception, of course, of the of the commercial news. So, my my sense is that the Chinese commercial news was um, was very much a Filipino newspaper, right? The, the problem, of course, is that it was the people. Most of the, the Chinese language newspapers, the three other Chinese language newspapers at the time, in particular the Great China Press and the Kong Li Bo, were, were KMT organs, right? And so the, for, for KMT extremists, they viewed uh, what was quite normal behavior on the normal ad reporting practice on the part of the commercial news as, as suspect. So again, it's, it's, you know, this is how the, the, the editors and, and the employees of the newspaper get into trouble. In, in 1962, and then again uh, in, in, 19, in 1970. So you're right, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's have another one. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Ricardo Leon. I went to the high school, Chinese high school in Manila. There are only two high schools. One is Cultural High School, the other one is Chiang Kai-shek. So they told us that we are communists but we are not. <laughs> <laughs> we are just more liberal, freer to say something in uh, cultural high school. But Chiang Kai-shek is Kuomintang, see? So we said, no, we don't want to be Chiang Kai-shek because Chiang Kai-shek stole a lot of money. <laughs> they went to Long Island, <laughs> fantastic. They live in a big house. So how can that be? 
So that's, I don't want to say too much anymore. I might be sued. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Okay. Uh, thank yes. you. Thank you for that. Okay. And, and, uh, yes, sir. Um, I'm Ivan from Kaisa. Uh, that was a very excellent presentation. I mean, the scholarship was really, um, um, you know, uh, it was very deep, no? And uh, uh, this is not really a question, but it's more of an anecdotal sharing. Because um, in one of my research, because I, I did um, another sort of obscure topic, uh, which is research on design history of the Manila Chinese Cemetery. Mm. And a lot of the tombs, the big tombs there, were, you know, big taipans. And in, in, in um, one of the bigger tombs there, uh, somebody actually told me that this is really in relation to what you were saying about how the community was were big supporters of the KMT. One um, uh, businessman actually donated an airplane to the KMT. Yeah. No, uh, another anecdotal um, uh, thing is that when I went to Taipei to the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial yes. Hall, the you'll see that thing. car. Yeah, yeah. There's a very big, fancy American car, and it says "very explicitly donated by the Philippine." Chinese. Chinese. Yeah. Now I forgot the exact year, but I saw that, and that kind of stuck to my mind. Yeah. How they were very, very ardent supporters of the KMT, yeah. and um, relating it to what Tessie was saying until the 1990s. I'm not really sure if this is related to that, but up until the 90s, uh, when I was in high school, we still had. Well, I went to a Catholic school, uh, so I wasn't sure if they were, <laughs> you know, you know, um, uh, affiliated with any parts. But it was a Catholic school. And we would have this um, yearly activity called the Tian Tan, where students go to Taiwan for six weeks for free, and it's sponsored by the Taiwanese government. It's really more of a cultural immersion. Yeah, uh, that you, you go to the um, to Benavides in Binondo, no? Yeah, yeah, Tian Tan, Tian Tan. And then, yeah, so it's a six-week sort of Chinese cultural immersion to Taiwan. And then you go there, you, you study shufa, you study calligraphy, you study all that. So <laughs> I'm not sure if that was all related to what Tessie was saying, you know, the KMT um, hegemony or influence to local yeah. Chinese education. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, thank you for that. Yeah, so if you if are ever in, in Taipei and you go to Chiang Kai-shek Memorial Hall, uh, the museum there has a magnificent limousine right, that was donated by, by Filipino Chinese businessmen uh, to, to Chiang Kai-shek, right. Uh, so these, I mean, the after when, by the 1990s, right, of course, Taiwan is no longer, or the Republic of China is no longer a member of the United Nations. And, and so by that point in time, it's, uh, you know, with martial law having come to an end, with Taiwan sort of increasingly marginalized in world affairs, uh, Again, it, it it has to it engages it engages in what 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 scholars call pragmatic diplomacy, right? And and obviously continues to sort of lean into or, or, or rely on these sort of existing outreach programs. Although by that point in time, of course, uh, the the whole anti-communist Fan Kong Kang Er dimension has sort of you know is no longer as as prominent as it as it once was, right? Like the the China Youth Corps are, are no longer heavily pushing uh, and advocating for, you know, the, the Kuomintang to reclaim, uh, to reclaim the mainland, to, to counterattack the mainland, right? Uh, but if you look at the 50s to 70s, again, at, 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 at Kaisa, there are all these, uh, all these, all these materials there, uh, all these published volumes on the various trips that all sorts of organizations in this country made to Taiwan during that period. We're not, we're not just talking here about the, the Chamber of Commerce or, or, or the, the Anti-Communist League, but just sort of, but schools, uh, uh, sort of hobby associations, right, veterans associations, all of them are making, uh, are visiting Taiwan. And I remember coming across in my research in Taiwan, a, a compilation, right? The, the, the ROC authorities uh, made note of all the overseas Chinese visits uh, to Taiwan on an annual basis, and despite the size of the community, the relative small size of the community, the most number of visits per year were typically from the, the Philippines, right? 
and they went for all sorts of reasons, right? They, they you know, teachers would go there to during the summer, uh, well, during the the middle of the year, at the middle of the year for uh, for teacher training, right? Prominent elites from the community would visit Taiwan, especially in October, to celebrate the Republic of China's National Day on October the 10th, right? To celebrate uh, Overseas Chinese Day and, and Chiang Kai-shek's birthday, which happened to be the at the end of October, so they would go for weeks on end sometimes, right? And while there, they would, you know, they they might visit Kimoi or they might give a give a speech that would be broadcast on on the on local radio stations, right, in support of of anti-communism, <coughs> right? Uh, that was the, you know, you're I, you're right. The the relationship doesn't just come to an end in the in the seventies, but I think the dynamics of it shift. And unfortunately, one has on, there's only so much that one can write about in a in a 300-page book, so I, but I would love for, for someone uh, to to pick up uh, pick up where I where I leave off, right, in, in the 70s, and, and to look at how Kuomintang hegemony declined um, from that from that period onwards. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, I think we have room for um, yes, sir. Please approach the mic. Uh, thank you. I would like to address this question to. Madam Teresita Ansi, you talked about uh, the influence of the KMT in the Philippines, and I want to find out whether the KMT has lost its grip in the Philippine landscape and has metamorphosed into the various Filipino Chinese enterprises, and thereby coming with something like a modern Chinese identity. That's it. Okay. Hello. Okay. Um, in relation to, to his question, I'd like also to, to, to ask you about how much of the anti-communist witch hunt was actually a counter-narrative to the integration movement. Uh, for example, if you really read through the, um, this is also by way of answering his question. <laughs> if you read through the Chinese commercial news uh, articles that were submitted. I'll use this. Okay, if you read through the articles submitted to the military tribunal against the Yu Yitung. I think only about uh, less than 10% of that are about China. Most of them, all of them are of pro the integration movement. So it is a counter narrative to the integration, the assertion of the identity of the Chinese Filipinos. The KMT at the time is really very Sino-centric, very ethnocentric, uh, chauvini Chinese chauvinist. Once a Chinese, always a Chinese. That is the mentality. I don't know how much of the anti-communist is really anti the ideology, because in the Philippines, there has never been any ideology to speak of. Even the KMT, you ask them what is San Min Tzu'i, what does it mean? They, they cannot tell you anything about it. And even the pro-leftists, you really ask them, no, do you know anything about United Front, about socialism, about, <laughs> about, uh, about all these things? It's, <laughs> it's actually, I, I would think that these are all pseudo-KMT and, and CC and Communist Party, but it's, it's not ideological based, but it's more, it's more on, the the affiliation with people who are pro-left and pro-right because the identity uh, if even at that time I would like to believe that uh, even at that time what I mean is during the Yuting brother affairs I would like to believe that most of the Filipinos Chinese Filipinos then were already educated here in the Philippines so they were born here, they were educated here. So the sentiment is more pro-Philippines, which the KMT at the time was trying to counter. Because they want, uh, when, especially when they moved to Taiwan, they needed the Chinese overseas 
to hold on to the Chinese overseas as their um, sphere of influence. Mm. So, so that that is why the influence extended up to the 1990s. Mm. So today, uh, it's it's almost totally gone. Uh, it's still there. The CVP is very is still very <laughs> active, um, but now the counter is the the <laughs> Chinese embassy here would frown upon the local Chinese Filipinos if you attend uh, mm. the, the pro-KMT events. Mm. Uh, like uh, we, we have the head of the federation who was severely ostracized by the Chinese embassy because he didn't know any better. He attended a CVP uh, event. <laughs> the, um, and then, uh, not, not the, the, the founder, the, the Tsimpotong. <laughs> And then he did not know that it is supposed to be really KMT. But, but it's also very petty of the Chinese embassy to be ostracizing him for attending that kind of event. So the influence is now very small. It was thank you to the Yuyitong affair that the KMT actually changed its name. It's no longer Kuomintang Party in the Philippines. It became Zongzipo, uh, um, um, what do you call that, uh, China, uh, cultural, Economic, um, cultural and economic association. Yeah, uh, Wenzong. It became Wenzong. Uh, at first, it's really Kuomintang uh, Zongzipu, but it became Wenzong. Uh, Wenjing Zonghui. Although I think the f the f its Facebook page is still facebook.com slash Kuomintang or something. Oh, <laughs> I, I don't have Facebook. So uh, the 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 influence here is more on those who are who have been doing uh, business. I think uh, they continue to still do business in the in Taiwan. And uh, actually, uh, during during the 60s to 70s, uh, when when they moved to Taiwan, a lot of Philippine uh, money, Chinese Philippine money, went to the, to help the the government, the founding of the uh, Yunhang, the, the Hua Chao Yunhang in Taiwan is mainly uh, overseas Chinese money and a lot of it is Chinese in the Philippines capital actually. So a lot, a lot of that went into building of Taiwan, so the, the, the influence is there. But after, after the lead organization, the federation uh, lost um, its ties more with K KMT and decided to go all out to China. So all the other organizations followed through. And now uh, the elections, the the head of the organization is no longer influenced by, by KMT. Thank you. Okay, um, we are a bit uh, pressed for time. Uh, if you have other questions, you can approach our um, reactors and our uh, main presenter a little later, and I would like to call on for the closing remarks, uh, Dr. Marjorie Y. Manabat. Direct, uh, Dr. Marjorie Manabat is the director of the Ricardo Leong Center for Chinese Studies. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning uh, to Professor Chen Wen Kung. Uh, thank you for sharing with us your findings about the dynamics of the pro KMT and pro Beijing factions after the war and the involvement of the Philippine government and our military. To Dean Zarina Saloma Akpedonu, and to uh, Father Aristotel D. and Dr. Dakuda of the History Department, thank you very much for making this event possible. Now to Mr. Sita Angsi of Kai Sapar sa Kaunlaran, um, thank you for showing us the simila similarities of the past to our current political atmosphere and how it shaped our laws in the country. She's one of the epitomes of Chinese by blood, Filipino by heart. And to Mr. Solomon Yui Tung for sharing with us her family's contribution in the reintegration of the Chinese to the Philippine society. And lastly, to Mr. Ricardo and Dr. Ricard Rosita Leong for your unwavering support in the propagation of the Chinese studies in the country. History, no matter how painful they are, makes us understand the events that led us to where we are now. It allows us to be more discerning in our actions. In fact, according to George, uh, George 
Santayana, yes. Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We hope that this morning's new information about our past will help us position ourselves as we continuously face issues that involves our neighbors and eventually find the balance as we nav navigate our relationship with China and Taiwan. Again, thank you very much for attending. And to those who are watching on YouTube, maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, we are done for today, and thank you very much for attending. We will just have some photo ops uh, for our distinguished speakers in front. President of Kaisa, you're here. Okay, I, uh, hello, um, for the President of Kaisa. Uh, Michael, uh, hello, sir. Uh, thank you very much for attending, and we really appreciate your presence uh, in this um, very eventful symposium. Okay, um, thank you very much for all attending. Uh, we really appreciate that you take your uh, took your time and be part of this um, seminar, and we look forward to more seminars perhaps in, in the future. Oh yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, and we also have to uh, award the certificate, ma'am. Oh. Okay, we will award this uh, certificate um, at the Neo de Mille University, the School of Social Science through the Ricardo Leong Center of Chinese Studies and Department of History in collaboration with CAISA, Para Sa Kaunlaran Incorporated and Philippine Association for Chinese Studies Incorporated. Award the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Chen Wen Kung in grateful recognition and sincere appreciation for his lecture on the Kumintang South Asian Stronghold, Anti-Communism Identity and Chinese in the Philippines, 1945 to 1970s. Issued this February 22, 2023 at the Ateneo de Manila University, assigned by Dr. Marjorie Y. Manabat and Dr. Patricia Irene Takudao of Chair of the Department of History. Father Ari?
Um, here, here, here. Uh, there's like 